The devil is sometimes portrayed as a red little fellow with horns and a tail, sometimes as a scary being responsible for all evil. Living Truth takes to the streets to find out what people think about the devil. Just who or what is he? Who or what do I think is the devil? Um, well, to me, the devil, there's definitely good in the world, and to me, that's bad. And the devil is, you know, evil. Is <laughs> evil. That would be the devil, right? The devil? Yeah. I think the devil is the bad guy. <laughs> No, I'd be completely honest. I actually don't believe in there being a devil. I think the devil is a state of mind, and I think that it's a self-inflicted state of mind. So if you think there is a devil, there is a devil. Um, I don't think there is a devil. Um, I think it's just uh, things people made up back in the day, and um, now people start to believe in it, and I, I don't really believe in it myself. Yeah, I think it's us at our worst. I think it's humanity at our worst. It's in all of us. We just have to decide if you tap it or not it's like a good or evil type of thing when people don't treat each other as they ought to be then they're acting on the devil's behalf i think that the devil was uh once the angel lucifer who defied god and he and the other angels went to hell on today's program charles price gives us the straight goods on the devil enemy number one satan and if you have a Bible with you, I'm going to read some verses from Ephesians chapter 6. And I'm going to read from verse 10 to verse 13. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. I'm going to take these verses out of their context, really. It's always good if you're studying a passage to do so in its context. But I'm going to run around the Bible tonight. And I want to read this as the springboard for the theme that I want to bring to you. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, Paul writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. That's as far as I'm going to read. I have a book here in front of me, which I picked up in the boardroom upstairs here in this church, and it's called Who's Who in Canada. It's about 30 years old, so there won't be anybody here in this book, I'm sure. Though Dr. Oswald Smith, who was the founder of this church, is in the book. There's about two and a half thousand people, and these are sort of distinguished, significant leaders in Canadian life. And uh, browsing through it has been uh, interesting. But I want to talk to you about who's who in the cosmos. You see, there's more going on in this world then we can see with our eyes or hear with our ears or even smell with our noses or taste with our tongues or feel with our hands. There's more than the tangible world that is going on. There is an invisible world, the Bible tells us, which is just as real as the visible world and we need to take it into account every bit as much as we take into account the visible world that we see and hear and feel and touch every day. That's the language of the verses that we read together in Ephesians 6. Not only that, but that indicates that there is a state of war that exists between much of the intangible world and the tangible world. That's why Paul writes, uh, our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Spiritual realms. And there is a world which consists of angels and of demons. There's a world which consists of God, but also of Satan. There's a world which consists of good, but alongside that, there is evil in our world. 
Now the popular notion is that people are pretty well neutral, that the world is neutral, we can create evil, we can create good. It's just unfortunate, it's the popular notion that folks around who create evil. But that is a very superficial understanding of what's going on in the world. Behind evil is not just people who are being corrupted, there are evil forces. I remember talking to Preston Manning on one occasion, in, in his years in Parliament in Ottawa, he said that it wasn't until after September 11, 2001, that he heard people stand up in Parliament and talk about evil as a reality in itself. He said, I never heard that in all my years in Parliament. But there was no other explanation that people had for what was going on. And so they began to describe in terms of evil. Now, we don't know a lot of the behind the scenes going on, and we're unwise to try and speculate about the things we don't know about. We're told in Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29 that the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things which are revealed belong to us and to our children. There are certain things which God has revealed, and what we know about the behind the scenes issues are things which God has revealed to us. We may see symptoms of it in all kinds of ways, and those symptoms teach us a lot. But there are things which are not revealed, and those things which are not revealed, we're told, do not belong to us. They belong to God. And maybe one day, in all the time of eternity, though eternity is not based on time, but throughout eternity, we might know some things we don't know now. But there are things that we do know now. And we would be wise to understand that we live in a battlefield, We'd be wise to understand that we are, that we have an enemy in the field. Now, if we say that we're in a battle as we are, how do we identify? How do we identify the, the enemy? What are we fighting against? In the book of James, chapter 4, James identifies three areas of battle. And these areas are the flesh, the world and the devil. In verse 1 of James 4, he says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires of battle within you? Because the first battle is taking place within your own heart. The devil doesn't need to get involved in that because you and I ourselves are corrupt enough for there to be a battle between the spirit and the flesh, as Scripture elsewhere describes it. There's the flesh. Then in verse 4, he says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Now, the word world is used differently in Scripture. God loves the world, but at the same time, there's a world that God does not love. And that world is the spirit of worldliness, which John in his epistle describes as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. This, he says, is from the world. We fight against the spirit of the world. And in verse 7 of that chapter, he says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So he identifies behind the flesh and the world this prime agency of the devil. And enemy number one is the devil, Satan. He's known by different names. Now I want to talk to you about Satan. But what Scripture tells us about him? You know, one of the big philosophical questions in the world surrounds the existence of evil in a world that God created as good. You remember God's verdict on his creation was it was good, very good. And yet there is the existence of evil, there's the existence of pain, there's the existence of suffering. And evil is a very obvious present reality in the world in all kinds of ways. So who is the devil? Is he a negative image of God? A negative mirror image of God? There's God one side, the devil the other. We know God is slightly strong. He's going to beat him. But there's this kind of dualistic view of the world, these two forces fighting it out. Is that how we should understand it? Is the devil simply a hypothesis to explain evil? We personify the reality of evil in the world by saying, well, there's a person called Satan, but it's really uh, a hypothesis is not real. George Barner is a researcher in America. He asked a number of people this question. 
Do you agree strongly or agree somewhat or disagree somewhat or disagree strongly with the statement the devil or Satan is not a living being but a symbol of evil? Of those who identified themselves as born again, 32 agreed strongly Satan is not a living being, but a symbol of evil. Thirty-two of those who said they were born again believers in Christ. Eleven percent said, I agree somewhat that the devil is not a living being. And five percent of those born again said they don't know if the devil is a living being or not. Put those figures together, forty-eight percent of Christians, that's almost half of Christians either regard Satan as only symbolic or they regard him as non-existent or they don't know whether he exists or not. Well, the Bible speaks about him as a person who acts, who thinks, who makes decisions, who is independent of any other force in terms of what he does. Now, I heard about two two six-year-old boys on one occasion who were talking about the existence of Satan and one boy said, there isn't any devil. The other boy said, what do you mean there isn't any devil? It talks about him all the way through the Bible. I don't know how six-year-olds know that, but apparently this one had a good Sunday school background. And the first replied, no, it's not true. It's just like Santa Claus. The devil turns out to be your dad. Well, he's not your dad. (laughs) You might have a foothold in your dad, but he's not your dad. But I want to talk first of all about his origin. If Satan exists, where does he come from? Let me go back to the first question. If God is such a good God, and he created everything well, and created everything with the verdict it was good, how is it that evil does come into existence. That's a huge question. I won't answer it tonight, of course, but I want to just answer one aspect. How does a good God become responsible for creating an evil devil? And the answer is an interesting one. The answer is this. God did not create an evil devil. What he did create was a beautiful angel. An angel who surpassed the beauty of every other aspect of his creation. He was called the morning star, which literally translated in Hebrew means Lucifer. Morning star meaning the most beautiful star in the sky, the, most, the brightest star in the sky. Let me read you two passages in the Old Testament scripture that we recognize are a revelation of the origins of Satan. First of all, in Ezekiel chapter 28, and you have a lament here that begins against the king of Tyre. begins actually in the beginning of the chapter. And then it goes on to speak in ways that are clearly not simply about the king of Tyre. king of Tyre was, uh, was a man who was born, lived and died. Tyre was a city north of Israel. And he begins to talk about somebody who was in existence long before this. Let me read you from verse 11. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre, and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. And he lists the whole catalog of these precious stones. Your settings and mountings were made of gold on the day you were created. They were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked amongst the fiery stones. You were blameless in all your ways from the day you were created until wickedness was found in you. And through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God. I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. 
By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries, so made a fire come out from you, and it consumed you. I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who are watching. And all the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You become a horrible end and will be no more. Now there's intermingling there, as prophecy sometimes does. Some things about the king of Tyre, and then he's a projection, he's a picture of uh, someone else. And you find coming out of this picture... Someone who was in the Garden of Eden, he says. Do you know, some years ago, I was talking to a, a group, about 200 teenagers, and I read some of these verses to them, and I said to them, I want you to tell me who you think these verses are describing. And I was selective in the verses I read to them. I read these verses. You are the model of perfection. You are full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You're on the holy mount of God. You walked amongst the fiery stones. You are blameless in all of your ways. I said, who do you think I was talking about? One of the kids put his hand up and said, Solomon. Well, probably because it says you were, you were full of wisdom. I said, that's, that's an interesting one. That's a good one. Anybody else? Somebody said, David. I said, anybody else? Somebody put his hand up and said, Jesus. I said, let me pause at that moment. There are three options we've been given there. Solomon, David, Jesus. Who do you think it is? Is it one of these men? You're the model of perfection, perfect in wisdom, perfect in beauty, blameless in all your ways. I said, put your hand up if you think it was Solomon. About 20, put their hands up. Put your hand up if you think it was David. And about three, put their hands up. I said, put your hand up if you think it's Jesus. And about 150 hands went up. They said, this sounds like Jesus. The model of perfection. I said, I'm going to surprise you. This is describing the devil. When God created him in perfection and beauty, but he says, your heart became proud, so I threw you to the earth. Let me read you from Isaiah chapter 14. You have another similar kind of description. This time it's talking about the king of Babylon. Verse 12, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I'll raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I'll make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you stare at you. They wonder at your fate. And he describes his downfall. That's where he's described the morning star. If you have a King James, it'll say, O Lucifer, son of the morning. I'll tell you a very interesting thing. The description morning star was also given to Jesus. In Revelation chapter 22, you'll find that Jesus says, described as the morning star. Here, Lucifer, the devil, is described as the morning star, the most beautiful. But he said, I'll raise my throne above the stars of God. As we'll see on another occasion, it seems to me that there is a hierarchy amongst the angels. There are angels, there are archangels, there are cherubim, there are seraphim. These are different functions, have different functions, different beings, there's different hierarchies there, but it seems supreme above them all, the archangel, there's only one archangel that's spoken of in scripture, his name is Michael, it's seemingly above the archangel Michael was the, was Lucifer. But he said, I want to be like God. By the way, if Satan has an agenda, it is that. It is to be like God. He said to Eve in the Garden of Eden, if you eat of the tree, you will be like God. If Satan has an agenda, it's to give people an ambition to be like God, to act like God. If you look at Isaiah 14, there are five I wills. 
the devil says in verse 13 and 14. I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the midst of the assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the top of the clouds. I'll make myself like the most high. Notice that those five I wills are all about going up, up, up. They're about ascending, being on top, being above. Isn't it interesting how then in verse 12, God says, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star. You've been cast down to the earth. Verse 15, you're brought down to the grave, the depths of the pit. Satan's ambition is up, up, up. The result is down, down, down. You compare that with Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, by the way. We have that beautiful description, being in very nature God. He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. He humbled himself and became obedient even unto death on a cross. And there you've got a picture of Christ Although he was, in every sense, co-equal with his father, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He made himself nothing by becoming a human being, put himself down, down, down. And interestingly, it says in that passage, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that's above every name, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. It's a total reverse. You notice that. Satan said, I want to go up, up, up. And God pushes him down, down, down. And when Jesus... In his humility, came down, down, down. God exalted him up, up, up. You know, many years ago, Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, who was a preacher in Philadelphia, he came to England and preached at an event called the Keswick Convention. This is, this is 60 years ago. He's been dead a long time. But he said something which has often been quoted since. He said, the way up is down, and the way down is up. If you want to learn something from the devil, you try to push yourself up. God will make it his business to pull you down. But you humble yourself. He will exalt you. You walk humbly with God and leave God with the consequences. And so the key behind Satan is pride. Your heart became proud, Ezekiel 28 says. And it's, the devil's agenda is to be like God and everything he does is to supplant God with other forms, human form human activity, then the driving force is pride. Your heart became proud. You know, in the early centuries of the church, the church fathers, in their wisdom, tried to consider the relative seriousness of various moral faults that they saw in people and saw around them, and probably saw in themselves. And they came up with a list of what they called the seven deadly sins. And uh, these seven deadly sins still have a, an important place in the Roman Catholic Church and Roman Catholic teaching. But they are wise. It would be wise to know these seven deadly sins because we face them all the time in our own hearts. And they placed in first place pride. It was the sin by which Satan fell. If you want to know the others, it was covetousness. It was number two. Satan was covetous as well. Lust was number three, envy was number four, gluttony number five, anger number six, and sloth, laziness, number seven. So God never created an evil devil. He created a beautiful angel, but God could have created a robotic angel who did exactly what he wanted because God programmed him to do so, but he didn't create a robotic angel anymore. He created robotic people. He created him with freedom to say, I will obey. And inherent in that freedom to say, I will obey, is the freedom to say, I will disobey. I will rebel. And Satan rebelled. And as a result, as we will see the implication of this later, he was cast out of heaven. And we're told he was cast down to earth. Earth is where Satan lives. Not hell. He will one day move on. But right now, he lives on earth. That's where he operates. That's his origin. The second thing I want to talk about is his personality, because Satan has a personality. 
is not just an evil force, as I mentioned earlier, that some have suggested, and many seemingly born-again Christians are prone to believe. He's just an evil force in the world. No, he's a, he's a person. Actually, we're told that he has physical form. There's no record of that physical form being seen by human eyes or by physical eyes. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 39 to 40, says, All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. By the way, that gives you a problem if you're an evolutionist. Different kinds of flesh. But then he goes on to say, there are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies. The splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. Now there are heavenly bodies. Now if Satan was created as an angel, the greatest of all the angels, we know that there have been times in history and times in scripture when angels have made physical appearances. There's actually no record of demons making physical appearances. Demons possess people and express themselves through somebody else's body and personality. Angels never do that. But there is record of angels appearing in physical form. And we can assume from this that the devil has a physical form. But when I speak of him, his personality... I'm thinking more of the fact that he has a mind, he has emotions, he has a will. These are the three components of personality. The ability to think, the ability to feel, and the ability to choose. We're told he has a mind, he has intelligence. 1 Corinthians, sorry, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, says, I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may also be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Now he talks there about the serpent's cunning. The serpent is another name for the devil as he appeared in that form. And if you have the devil appearing in any physical form in Scripture, it is as the serpent, but he thinks, he has a mind, he's cunning. He also possesses, possesses emotions, We've already seen that pride was the motivation that drove him in his rebellion against God. But we're also told he has anger. Revelation chapter 12, verse 12 says, Rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows his time is short. Filled with fury. Now, interestingly, there are negative emotions attributed to Satan, pride and fury. There are no positive emotions ever attributed to Satan. Love, joy, peace, these are not emotions that are ever part of his experience. Now, in his state of being rejected out of heaven, instead he is consumed with negative emotions of anger and fury and pride, jealousy, destruction. But he also possesses a will. And I want to read you what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24, where he talked about the Lord's servant, speaking about Timothy there, who was leading the church in Ephesus. The Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone. He must be able to teach, not resentful. And those who oppose him, because that's part of life, Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses, listen to this, and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Now, Paul says to Timothy, you're going to find those who will oppose you in Ephesus as you seek to lead the church of God there. They will oppose you. You'll find this, he says. But you deal with them gently and trust that God will give them repentance, will bring them to the knowledge of the truth, because otherwise their senses are being trapped by the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Because the devil has a will. 
Jesus said to Simon Peter just before Jesus was arrested, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. There's some interesting things there we'll talk about another time. That Satan needs permission. He's asked to sift you like wheat. And don't forget that when you think of what happened later that same day when Peter, or early in the following morning, Peter denied Jesus three times and cursed and swore and lied, ended up in tears. Don't forget that Jesus said, Satan is asked to sift you like wheat. And presumably, permission had been given. And the devil had attacked him because he has a will. We are protected. The devil does need permission. We are told no temptation has taken you that is not common to man, but God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you're able to bear, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape that you might be able to endure it. But God does allow us to be tempted. Now, if that's Satan's origin and his personality, thirdly, his location. Now, he was originally in heaven. We've already seen that as one of the angels of God. But he was cast to earth. Ezekiel 28:17 says, I threw you to the earth. Isaiah 14:12 says, you've been cast down to the earth. Jesus, in Luke 10, verse 18, when he addressed the 72 who returned, surprised that demons submitted to them in his name, Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I saw him driven out. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3, talks about the dragon, which is a description of Satan, one of the other pictures of him. Let me just read these verses to you, actually. Uh, Revelation chapter 12, and verse 3 and 4, it says, Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept the third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. We'll talk about that probably next week, uh, what that implies. But he talks about them curling these uh, stars to the earth. Actually, it's probably the origin of demons. Stars is a word used to describe angels. And when the devil rebelled, a third of the angels joined him in his rebellion. It would seem to be what it indicates. But verse 9 says, the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. The devil has been hurled to the earth, along with those angels with him. And this is the place where he operates. This is the place where he works. This is the place where he lives. Now he gets hauled back into heaven once in a while, by the way. We know that from some insight in the book of Job. And we only know what we, can, what we discover in Job chapter 1 because God must have revealed it. Because it tells us that God in heaven called his angels before him. One day, Job 1 verse 6 says, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth and going back and forth in it, because that's what he does. He roams throughout the earth, but once in a while it seems God grabs hold of him by the scruff of his neck and hauls him up to heaven, sits him down and says, Hey, how are you getting on? Then he picked on Job. How are you going with Job? Hey, there's nobody like Job. He's righteous, he fears God, he shuns evil. And Satan said, yes, but the reason why you ask me about Job is because you know everything has gone well for Job. You've built a hedge around Job. I can't get at him. You've made life so good for him because he's rich and prosperous and he has a lovely family. And God said, all right, we'll take the hedge down, but these are the limitations. You can touch his possessions. You can even touch his children, but you can't touch his body. And don't touch his life. There's some interesting insights just from that one event. One is that Satan is accountable to God. And God sets the boundaries around Satan, and God can change those boundaries when he, whenever he chooses to. Satan, you can attack Job. And you remember how Satan attacked Job. Job knew nothing about it, but he suddenly one day found that his livestock had all been killed and stolen and taken away. 
And then his children all were killed when a, when a hurricane hit the house where they're having a party. They were all, all dead. And then in chapter 2, Satan's hauled back to heaven again. How are you getting on with Job? Well, you knew and you said I could touch everything, but his body, the man's so selfish. And as long as he doesn't feel any physical pain, he couldn't care about his kids and everything else. And God said, all right, you can touch his body. God changes the boundary again. Okay, he can touch his body. Don't take his life. And Job got sores from the top of his head and the soles of his feet. He found nowhere comfortable, went and sat in the ash heap and scratched himself with broken pottery. And at least the ash heap was sterile. And his wife turned nasty and said, curse God and die. And you probably know the rest of that story. Now that God took him through this experience, when I say God took him through, God permitted it. It was Satan who did the attacking on him, but with God's permission. And Satan, although he is on earth, and although, as we're going to see another occasion, he is prince of this world, we're told the whole world is in the power of the evil one. I hear Christians say that the world is in God, that God is sovereign across the world. The Bible tells me the devil has power over the world. Now, God is ultimately sovereign, of course. But there are things that are going on which are not the will of God in our world. You can be sure of that. And the devil's work. But he gets hauled up to heaven, sat down before God, interrogated. We're taught in Revelation 12, the accuser of our brothers accuses them before God day and night. He has access to God. He accuses us before God. We spoke, Ephesians 6, of that term, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He operates in the heavenly realms. Now, don't get the idea, and I think we'll go this far and we'll stop in a few moments. Don't get the idea that God and Satan are two equal forces. One is bad, one is good. Maybe God is slightly stronger. They are totally different. Satan is not the antithesis of God. It's very important we understand that. You see, God had no beginning. Satan was created. We don't know when he was created. We don't know when the angels were created. But he was created. Ezekiel 28 says that. In the day you were created. God is omnipresent. He's in all places all the time. Satan is not. He is local. He goes to and fro across the earth. It's a very interesting verse in Revelation 2, verse 13, which talks about Pergamum in present-day Turkey. And it says, I know where you live. It's where Satan has his throne. It sounds like there's some kind of satanic headquarters in Pergamum. That's where Satan has his throne. But he moves around. He's not in all places at the same time. Now, this raises some questions about the scope of Satan's activity. I mean, can Satan be in Mongolia tonight and in Canada tonight? Presumably not, if he goes to and fro. Is it correct to say, Satan is tempting me when we come under temptation? Well, let me give you two possible answers to this. It is true that angelic beings have powers beyond ours, and although angelic beings are not omnipresent, that is, in all places all the time, they may be able to be multipresent. That means present in more than one place at the same time. And multipresence is not omnipresence. And maybe amongst angelic beings and satanic and demonic beings, there are multipresent capacities, but not omnipresent ability. That's one possible thing. But, of course, when the, de- when the Scripture speaks of, of Satan, attributes things to Satan, sometimes that is attributing them to, the, to demons who operate along with Satan, under his control. Very much as you might say that Nelson beat Napoleon at, water, at the Battle of Waterloo, while Nelson commanded the Navy. Or we say, you know, Hitler invaded Poland. Hitler was sitting back in Berlin when they invaded Poland. But we say Hitler invaded, what we mean is that his armies, it was his decision. Or we say Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Or we say George Bush invaded Iraq. What we mean is, not that these individuals were actually doing the invading, but they're the ones who were the strategists and the decision makers behind the invasion. So when we talk about Satan attacking and Satan tempting, often what scripture means is that under his direction. Demons are active and working. We'll talk about demons another day because there are many demons who work alongside Satan, Scripture tells us. 
But God is omnipresent, the devil is local. God is omnipotent, that means he's all-powerful. Satan is restricted. We saw that in the book of Job. We saw he had to ask permission to sift Satan. And God gave permission for Job to be attacked. He gave permission, for, presumably, for Simon Peter to be sifted. And God does give permission. And by the way, let's... let's, let's uh, be realistic about that. I was once in a prayer meeting when somebody in the prayer meeting began to... It was before I was about going to preach, actually. It was a prayer meeting before service. I was going to preach at. And somebody was praying. And they suddenly stopped praying to God and began to pray to Satan, as people do from time to time in prayer meetings. And this is what this person said. They said, Satan, you have no right here tonight. I command you in the name of Jesus to leave this building and do not be involved in this meeting and do not touch any life of anybody in this meeting. And they spoke very forcibly to Satan. At the end of that meeting, before the main service, I said to this person, I was interested in your prayer. How do you know Satan doesn't have permission to be here tonight? And she said, well, we're to refuse him permission. I said, well, sure, we are to resist the devil, but resist him right here on the spot. It may be he's been talking to God in heaven, so can I go to that meeting tonight? And God said, you can go. Because God gives permission. That's the point I'm making. I'm not being trivial about this. The point is not the luxury of saying, Satan, clear out of this building so we can just, you know, not be bothered by you. Our job is to resist him in the battle. This is where we are. We're told to resist him. And by the way, he is restricted. He's limited. And you can resist him. We'll see that another time. The other thing is that God is omniscient. That is, he knows everything there is to know. Satan is not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. Satan seems to be ignorant of some things. When we're told that Satan entered Judas, when Judas betrayed Jesus, and we're told specifically Satan entered into Judas, he presumably thought that was a smart thing to do. To get the Messiah crucified was, was smart. He did not know. That, of course, would be his own downfall. Now, of course, to get Judas to betray the Lord Jesus Christ in that way was in itself a, a corrupting thing. But there are all kinds of things to indicate that Satan doesn't understand the end time, doesn't understand the end result, and that he is therefore battling in ignorance in some cases. Let me just give you one last thing, which I think I should. And that is, we talk about his origin, his personality, his location. Let me talk about his destination, because you need to know and be sure of that. His destination is unambiguous in Scripture. He is heading for hell. Hell was created specifically for Satan and his angels. Matthew 25, verse 41 says, He has said, Lo's in his left, was talking about separating the sheep and the goats. Depart from me, you who are cursed and eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And in Revelation chapter 20, we're told that when Christ returns, let me read you, Revelation chapter 20, in verse 1, I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the keys of the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. Well, that's a thousand years in which he's going to be bound in this pit. But after that, it says he must be set free for a short time. And verse uh, 7 says, When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison. He'll go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number, they're like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into a lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. And that's the devil's last mention. One of the things the devil does is accuse us of our sin, you know. He's the accuser of the brethren. But I, I saw a t-shirt once that said this, when the devil reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. 
He's beaten. Destined for eternal destruction. Somebody asked me the intriguing question one day. Could the devil get converted? Could we pray for that? Would there be any point in that? Well, we're told that when it comes to salvation, angels look into this and would long to experience the joy that we experience with salvation. Angels are not accessible to salvation. Although the devil is active now, he is under the authority of a sovereign God. And when we talk about the fact that he is the God of this world, he is the prince of this world, he is the prince of the power of the air, several of the descriptions about him, it is under that sovereignty, and so he comes to God. Can I, can I have permission? Now, I'll tell you this, when God gives Satan permission to attack, it's not because God is interested in your destruction, though Satan is, it's because God is interested in your perfection, and it is again and again the attacks of the devil that bring about our perfection. That's partly why I say the devil is ignorant. That's what happened to Job. Job looked back. My eyes had heard of you before. All of, my ears had heard of you before all this, but now my eyes have seen you. Something's happened because out of this attack, I've experienced something I never experienced before. Simon Peter was a better man after he broke down in tears. I, I believe that was a turning point in Peter's life. You let the devil enough. God gives the devil enough access to break you. And when you're broken, that's the time. God begins to rebuild you. So don't be scared when the devil is attacking. It'll be opportunity to grow. Thank you for joining Charles Price on today's program. Next week, join Living Truth for another topic from the series, Who's Who in the Cosmos. Charles Price teaches about identifying demons.